Okay, um, thank you for coming. Let me point out that the handout is available for download now at this bit.ly URL. A lot of facts and figures, a lot of charts and stuff, so you're going to want that. And here's our agenda for the next 45 minutes. There's, <laughs> I'm in one of these uh, time deficit slide excess situations. I think 50 something slides for 45 minutes, so I'm going to try and get through it pretty quickly. Um, the agenda is we're going to cover what per title encoding is. We're going to look at the, uh, the technologies that I work with. We're going to look at the tests, and then we'll look at the results. So what is per title encoding? Uh, per title encoding is customizing the encoding for each file. It kind of appeared four or five years ago as frame by frame optimization from companies like Beamer and Euclid IQ. It was made famous by Netflix in December of 2015 when they announced that they were doing per title encoding. Um, the first third party implementation was from a company called Capella Systems with their Cambria encoder, so you could start doing it with your own files. And now pretty much all encoding vendors. Um, offer a per title encoding feature. Elemental Technologies, for example, launched one at, um, at NAB 2019. Or you can do it yourself via CAP CRF, and we're going to talk about um, how that works and how that uh, scored in the, in the test that, that I did. Let's talk real quickly about the evolution of per title and some of the implications of that evolution. As I said before, it started with frame by frame optimization from uh, a number of companies. What's good about that is you get um, different data rates based upon the complexity of the video. What's bad about that is you don't get any kind of fixed bit rate control. So if you optimize on a frame by frame basis, this is the file that has 30 seconds of talking head followed by 30 seconds of ballet, um, your data rate goes up with the complexity. You can cap that, but you can't really, you can't do a CBR encode, you can't do a constrained VBR encode. So if something like this makes you nervous, Optimization from a deliverability standpoint, then um, optimization technologies are, may not be for you. The uh, second rung of that was, was the per title encoding from, from Netflix. And basically, what they do is they encode the file multiple times to gauge the complexity of that file. And then, once they gauge the complexity of the file, at least with the first iteration that they produced, um, they're able to encode with any te technique they want. They can use CBR, use VBR. Um, so if they want to control the bit rate and make it look something like this, I think they actually use 200% constrained VBR, so it wouldn't look like this, but it certainly wouldn't look like this. Either way, Netflix, their version of it is gauging complexity and then encoding traditionally once you know how complex the file is. The third range of per title was, again, from a company called Capella Systems. They, they used a script, or they use a script in the product to run through the file, they perform a CRF encode, they determine the complexity across the file, and then they uh, give you the ability to encode with CBR or VBR. So you can, uh, if you want a fixed bit rate that looks more like this, you can do it. And one of the things I'm not talking about is changing segment length. We'll talk about that when we get to the last, or this penultimate category. So in late 2017, what we saw was segment-based encoding. And this was from companies like Euclid and some others. So they divided the video up into segments, say six-second segments, and then they, they measured the complexity of that segment and then encoded that segment based upon the complexity of that segment. Not the video as a whole, but they did it on a segment-by-segment -segment basis. Um, again, with that technique, you can cap the video, but you can cap the data rate, but you may have a lot of variability in the data rate. I mean, who cares about variability at this point? Anybody? Who still uses CBR? Do you care about? OK, so I mean, it's kind of a religious thing. People who believe in CBR believe in CBR, and, and I'm sure they have network statistics to back that up. Um, but I just don't want to make this point too many times. With some per title optimization techniques, you get the ability to fix, you know, fix the bit rate allocation with others that you, you don't. And then the big thing last year was shot-based encoding, again, from Netflix. Netflix kind of um, you know, killed their own per title technology with an advancement that, that I think is pretty significant. And what they do here is, rather than using fixed segment lengths, which is what we saw with the segment-based encoding, they broke the video up into different shots, different scenes. 
So if you had a camera change, they would start a, a new encoding at that, at that scene change, and they would put a keyframe there, and they would have a segment length that varied with the duration of the scene change. So rather than have artificial six second segments, they would have a five second segment, a 10 second segment. And so long as all of the files in the bitrate ladder use the same keyframes and the same segments, you could switch without any kind of problem. So this is where they vary the segment length to optimize the overall quality of the file. And what's kind of cool about this is, you know, if you have one easy to compress segment, you have a very low bit rate. If the next one's a high motion segment, you can up the bit rate. The viewer's not going to notice any difference in the encoding because it happens at a scene change. Whereas if you, we've all seen a keyframe in the middle of a scene where that was noticeable because either it was a higher quality frame or the encoding was different. And that's something you eliminate with the shot based encoding. And then, Netflix's point, they, they don't have to use CBR or VBR. They can use QP-based encoding if they want to within a segment because it's just not that important. Um, OK, so Netflix's statistics, they call this dyna dynamic optimization. And they found significant bit rate reductions. They're saying they're saving 17% bit rate and increasing the VMAP score by 3.7 points. 3.7 points is very significant, particularly in the context of a 17% data rate reduction. And it's not codec dependent. You know, we're seeing bandwidth savings here for um, H.264, VP9, and HEBC, and they're all quite sig significant whether you measure them with VMAP or whether you measure them with, uh, with, with PSNR. And again, this is a situation where Traditional bitrate techniques don't apply. If this makes you nervous, shot-based encoding may not be for you. If you're okay with this, then it's a pretty good technology. The other issue is I'm not aware of any third-party vendors offering shot-based technology at this point. So if you want it, you're going to have to make it yourself. Okay, so what did we see at NAB 2019? And what was exciting there was, if, if somebody asked you the question, and, and the question was, if you knew the precise allocation of different viewers on a per stream basis in your encoding ladder, would you encode it differently? If you knew that 100% of your viewers were watching the top level stream, or 88% were, were, were playing the mid level streams, would you encode the bit rate ladder differently? And the answer is, I think all of us would. And what we saw at NAB in 2019 was what, what Brightcove calls context-aware encoding. And what they do is they factor in the average bandwidth that their viewers are retrieving the video, as well as the devices that they're playing it on, and they factor that into the encoding ladder decision. So here we have a situation where we have three usage patterns on the left and three encoding ladders on the right. And up here, it's mostly mobile viewing with pretty low bandwidth. And here we see an encoding ladder that's concentrating on the lower rungs. And just to be perfectly clear, they're encoding the same video file three different ways. And so obviously, there's, they're doing per title encoding based upon the complexity of the video. But they're also changing how they construct the encoding ladder based upon the distribution pattern of that video. And then here is. Um, Mostly PC at, at relatively high bit rates. Here's the different ladder to account for that. And then here's an almost total high bandwidth ladder where we're, I can't really read the numbers on this display here, but I guess it's 100% as TV. And what we see in the ladder down here is we're seeing high concentration, high data rates here, and not a lot of uh, rungs down here. Why well, create rungs that nobody's going to view? So I think from my perspective, this is kind of the next big thing, because it really does change fundamentally how you create your encoding letters. And we're going to look at the, I put together a, a, a theoretical construct to rate the various per title technologies that I looked at. And when I did that rating, I used this data set to do it. So when I rated per title technologies last year, um, 
if there was an increase of VMAF quality of, say, 28 points in a very low rung on the encoding ladder, which is pretty easy to do, right? Because the original rung might be 320 by 180, but the per title encoding technology may produce a data rate that matches the low rung, but, but encode at 64360 or, or a higher resolution. In that case, you're going to get a significant boost of VMAF quality. But if only 0.002% of the people actually view that stream, you shouldn't factor. You shouldn't, it's not that big a deal for that technology. So really, what you want to do when you're analyzing a, a per title technology is analyze it in the context of how many viewers are watching which rungs in the encoding ladder. And to do that, I utilize this data set. And I'll get into that more when we get into how I scored the, uh, scored the videos. So I wanted to, um, wanted to talk a little bit about different features. So, so you're going to be evaluating per title encoding technologies, maybe for your own use, maybe to implement. And I wanted to go over some of the features that you'd be thinking about when evaluating these technologies. So, and I wanted to look at Netflix and YouTube kind of as examples so we could talk about what they're doing. And you know, what is the type? Uh, most all of them are going to evaluate complexity in some form or fashion and then encode. Netflix is the only one I know that does a brute force encode, just encodes the files multiple, multiple times until it comes up with the absolute best quality at the lowest possible bit rate, which you can do if your people are watching you know, your files eight or nine million times. Um, but they're the only company I know that does the brute force multiple encode. Everybody else encode, you know, measures complexity and then applies uh, a per title technique. The core schema really doesn't matter. Call it artificial intelligence, call it CRF. You know, it, it works or it doesn't. Number of passes is significant because that's going to control your cost, right? So if you have CRF, CAP CRF is a one pass technology. So, you know, that's going to give you twice or three times the capacity of a system that has two or three passes. So that, that translates directly into cost. Um, can you factor in quality of experience statistics? That's the point we just covered before. You know, I think that it, it's obviously relatively new. There's three companies doing it, Brightcove, Ep Epic Labs, and Mux. Um, so there's not a lot of encoders that do that. But I think, you, I, I think that's going to become quickly essential to people who want to get the, the maximum quality at the lowest possible bit rate. And then can you adjust the data rate? Yeah, they all can do that. Can you adjust the number of rungs in the ladder? That's a pretty significant one. So for some technologies, including CAP-CRF, you start out with seven rungs, you end up with seven rungs. Uh, Elemental, who is not one of the companies that I tested, works the same way. You, you encode seven rungs, they adjust each rung, each rung separately. That can work pretty effectively, as we'll see with the results for CAP CRF, but it's really not that optimal because in some cases, you end up with an encoding ladder um, that looks like this down here. So what we have here is the starting point. Um, So here's the starting point for all our encodes. You know, how do we compare per title technologies? We compare them to a fixed encoding ladder. And this is the fixed encoding ladder that I, that I used as my starting point. So this is what we started with. And some technologies will reduce the number of rungs in the ladder. So this is bit moving technology. So they're taking seven rungs. They're reducing it to three rungs. Now, they're still covering all the bit rates, right? So here's the bit rates here. This is obviously an easy to encode file. But they're reducing the number of rungs from this to this. And this is a technology that doesn't reduce the number of rungs. And they're creating, you know, they've got a rung at 194 kilobits per second, which is the one you're going to play. And they create five rungs down here that you'll never use. And these, these rungs can interrupt your you know, the smooth operation of your adaptive bitrate streaming. Uh, you don't want to be switching between these rungs just because they're there. So it's really beneficial in a lot of instances to adjust the number of rungs. It's also important to adjust the resolution of rungs, which again is something CAP-CRF doesn't do, something that Elemental doesn't do. Um, because when you deploy, deploy higher resolution files with higher VMAF scores, you can push those lower in the ladder. So again, this is bit move, and they start out with the 1080p iteration. And this is a starting point from our analysis, 1080p, 720p, 540p, 480p. This is what bit move output. Two 1080p iterations, 
a 16 by 9, a 10, 10, 1024 by 576, 64 by 360. And what they're doing is they're getting higher VMAF scores that they can push down lower in the ladder. And you can't do that if you don't change the resolution. This is YouTube, which I scored just kind of for fun because I could and I wanted to see how they performed on, on the, under the analysis that I, um, that I applied. And what you see with YouTube is they've got, they jump in all instances, they produce a five rung ladder. Um, they jump from 1080p to 720p to 480p. And there's this huge gap between 87 VMAP and 64 VMAP that, that's going to really reduce the quality in, in the distribution schema that, um, that Brightcove presented that I use in my analysis. This file is retrieved about 65% of the time, this 13% of the time, and this uh, I think 9% of the time. So because they don't have enough files at the high end, they're reducing the quality sig significantly here and to some degree here as well. So it's really good to adjust the number of rungs in the ladder and the resolution in the ladder to get the optimal quality uh, from the per title encodes. And then I guess there was one more feature I wanted to talk about. And the concept of customizability, um, what I'm talking about there is can you make decisions like forcing the per title encoding technology to achieve a minimum bit rate here and a maximum bit rate here. So this is CAP CRF. When you apply CAP CRF, you basically say encode this to CRF 23 and don't make the data rate any higher than whatever the number you set is. But it doesn't guarantee that you're going to get a 250 kilobit per second segment. So if you, if you use, again, I'm, I hate to pick on Elemental, it's just one I'm familiar with, but if you use Elemental or CAP CRF or any technology that doesn't provide you with the custom, customization capability, if you really, really need a 250 or lower stream, you may not be able to get that. So I don't know how many people care about, you know, with, with, a, with a high motion clip, the minimum might be five or 600. So you, you may totally lose a class of customer that you definitely address in your traditional um, encoding ladder. Okay, so here are the contestants that I'm going to talk about out loud. Um, CAP CRF, we'll, look at, we'll see how that works and we'll, um, and we'll look at the results. YouTube, again I did that because I thought it would be interesting to see how well they operate. Obviously it's not a commercial site. Bitmovin was actually our winner, um, so I'll mention them by name. Uh, and there were three other technologies that I looked at. Two of them, the, the scores I get back from Hybrick, my uh, cloud encoding analysis, just didn't feel right. Um, I wasn't 100% confident in the score, so I wanted to run those scores through a, a different uh, VMAF scoring system to make sure that they were right before I publicly announced those results. And there was one third um, third company, where the results were just really bad, and it was a, it was a small company, so I'm just not going to name them. Uh, I felt it was kind of unfair, it's kind of their first shot out. So we'll, we'll have unsub one, unsub two, and unsub three, and um, I'm going to reissue the results in about three to four weeks once I'm confident in the output uh, quality from uh, these two here. Probably will never announce who this company is. So how did I test? I tested with 21 files, about 51 minutes in total. And you see the files over here, and you see the file groupings over here. So I had, I guess, three animations. I had um, five or six movie-ish type files. I had some synthetic files for corporate use, other business files, and then I had five sports videos. So it's an interesting mix of files to encode. And here's the fixed encoding ladder. Here's the specs. You, you saw kind of a look at that before. Coming over here because I can't, the laptop screen's like this big, so I can't, not, not providing much of a preview. So this is my scoring mechanism. <laughs> and it's, it, I mean, anytime you start scoring, 
per title encoding it gets complicated. And this one, some of it will make a lot of sense, some of it won't make so much sense, but let's go through it. This is, um, these are the companies that I looked at, YouTube, CapCRF, Unsub1, Unsub2, Bitmovin, and Unsub3. And brown scores are the worst in the category, green scores are the best in the category, and you can see why Bitmovin looks like the winner here. Some of these are more important than others. Obviously, this is the storage saved. So we, you know, we know how much storage was required for the CBR, um, for the uh, constrained VBR encodes, the, the, uh, the set of files that I showed you a moment ago. The per title technology returns a different set of files, and then we measure the bit rate reduction in those files. So that's the storage. And then we, through an analysis that we'll look at in a moment, or let me, let me go through it this way. So the first thing I wanted to measure was the standard deviation of the 1080p score. So essentially, what's at the heart of these per title encoding technologies is a, is a complexity measurement system. They look at the video file and they say, how complex is this video file? What data rate do I need to produce to get good enough quality? And what I did to measure quality was VMAP. So what I did here is I lined up all the 1080p highest quality files and I measured the standard deviation of the, um, of the VMAP quality of that. And the worst was three, which isn't, isn't really terrible given that the score goes from zero to 100. But we see that lower scores, particularly in Bitmovin's case, had the, the highest degree of accuracy, or at least the highest degree of accuracy as measured by VMAP. And that translated to a whole bunch of green, a whole bunch of success in their operation. So we looked at that. We looked at the storage saved, again, the, about 50 minutes of video. We looked at the streaming bit rate saved, and I'll, I'll show you how that's computed in a second. We looked at the overall impact on QOE as measured by PSNR, SSIM, and VMAF. We looked at the rungs saved. So when we talk about rungs saved, we mean you know, how many fewer rungs did this technology produce than the baseline encodes we did. So each, we had 21 files. Each file had seven rungs, so we started off with 100 and 147. And then how many fewer rungs did each technology bring back? We see YouTube was the best here, um, but Bitmovin did, did a pretty good job with that as well. Errors are ladder integrity issues. So Apple says that the individual rung should be one, between 1.5 and 2. 100% apart from a data rate perspective. Why do they say this? Because if they're too close together, you have unnecessary stream switching. If they're too far apart, you leave people stranded at too low a quality level, too low a data rate. So what I did was um, anytime it's not either between 150% between and 200%, I get a red background in this line here. And if it's over 10% more than it should be, it's an error. So what I saw with YouTube in particular was a lot of errors with the jumps. You know, this one's not really that significant. It's 2.8. This one's 2.67. You really do need another rung between this rung and this rung to, to account for people who may be hitting at this bandwidth. And then I looked at the good decisions and bad decisions. And the, the, theory, the theory here is what would you do if you were encoding manually? So, and what I mean from that perspective is, how would you adjust the data rate if you were behind the encoding controls? A bit about VMAF, because we're going to rely on that pretty significantly. VMAF has a range of 0 to 100. Um, typically, the top target is between 93 and 95. Beyond that, there's no perceptible quality improvement. Um, the scores match to, match to subjective ratings. and a difference of six VMAP points is a significant difference. So I'm going to refer to VMAP a lot, and these are some of the, the, some of the points that I'll, I'll be referring back to. And we don't need to look at that. So when we talk about good decisions and bad decisions, this, in the baseline encode, this basketball video clip, we encoded at a fixed bit rate of 4.5 megabits per second. That was the target, which gave us a VMAP rating of 98.72. 
So if I was encoding that manually, I would drop the data rate because I would get, want the data rate closer to, say, 94, 93. In this case, this technology, which is unsub 3, dropped the data rate to 4 megabits per second, dropped the VMAP to 96, which nobody's going to notice, so that's a good decision. Does that make sense? Down here, the skateboard video started out at, again, 4.5 megabits per second, a VMAP score of 95. The same technology reduced the data rate down to about 1.9 megabits per second, reduced the VMAP down to 86. So reduce the VMAP from above 93 to below 93, and that's a bad decision. You might want to reduce the bit rate a little bit, but you wouldn't want to reduce it all the way to 86. You wouldn't want to reduce it under 93. So in this case, I would call it a bad decision. The only files I looked at for the good and bad decisions were the top rated file. Why? Because, <laughs> because there's, it, it's a lot of work and it's a lot of opportunity for error, so I wanted to just look at one rung and, and, um, and keep it at that. So the, the kind of the uh, taxonomy I used was, a good decision was if the VMAP was above 95 and you drop the data rate, which is the, the top one we saw, but you stay over 93, or if the VMAP is under 93 and you increase the data rate, because that's what I would do if I was looking at the file. Um, a bad decision is you increase the data rate when VMAP is above 94. 94 is, is sufficient quality. If you don't drop the, the data rate and VMAP when it's above 95, anytime you reduce the VMAP below 93, and if you decrease the data rate if the VMAP is already below 93. So that's, you, and then this is where it gets really dense, but we're almost through this, so. I wanted to come up with a scoring mechanism, uh, wins, home run, losses, and draws. And I'm going to go through this pretty quickly. You're just going to have to trust me on this. But there were a number of different scenarios I wanted to account for. One is when the data rate, the average bit rate, was taken down by one megabit per second. And then depending on what you did with the VMAP score here, the result was either a loss, a draw, or a win. If it was between minus one and plus one, same thing here. And if you increase the data rate, there were scenarios where you'd have a loss, draw, or win. So if you up the data rate by one megabit per second, you'd have to up the VMAP score by over one to get a win. On the other hand, if you drop the data rate by one megabit per second, any increase in VMAP was a win because you're dropping the data rate. And it, like I said, it gets really arcane, but I, I was trying to figure out a way to, again, analyze the decisions. Anytime you increased VMAF over 1.5, it was a home run. So, and the starting point for scoring is, you know, here's the, the constrained VBR baseline ladder. Here's the per title in code. A lot of times they don't particularly match up. So what you have to do is you have to slot different videos into the viewing slot here based upon the bit rate. So we're going to look at the allocation from Brightcove in a moment. But some people have a bit, uh, bandwidth limitation of 275 kilobits per second. They're going to play a file in this range. Some people are higher here. Some people are higher here. And what we had to do is say, OK, these are the files we got back from the per title encoding technology. Which file would they view? if they were connecting at 250, 450, 900, like this. So we're allocating the files to the output encoding ladder based upon the viewing bandwidth. And the original files over here were 250, 500, 900. And here I used 110% of those values. So if you were under 110% of 250 kilobits per second or 275, you, you played here. Does that make sense? So we're allocating the files returned from the per title technology to the encoding ladder that people actually viewed. And then we looked at how the, how the scores and the, and the bit rates compared on a rung by rung basis. So we computed the differences in bit rate, the differences in VMAF, and then we applied the allocation from the middle Brightcove model. Why did we do that? Again, because 
Here we have a VMAP increase of 40 because we're using a higher resolution file down here, but it's only viewed by 0.19% of the viewers, so we don't want to we don't want to rate this rung as high as we would rate this rung. Does that make sense? I know it's incredibly dense, um, but it, you know, I wanted to come up with a, a reasonable scoring system. Up here, if we have a 4.64 increase in VMAF, that file is viewed by 13.48 of the people. So that gives you a, an overall effect that's much more significant. In, again, in previous in previous trials, I weighted all these the same. So a 40% a 40 in, 40 point increase here would have the same weight as a, a, a as a 40 point increase here, which makes no sense because 1% of the people are viewing this or less, and a lot of people are viewing that. And then one last thing. Um, So constrained VBR, here we have a VMAP score of 96.63. That drops to 94.95. So, and this 1080p file is played 71% of the time, so this could have a significant impact on the overall score. So what's the argument for excluding this from the analysis? The argument for excluding this from the analysis is that anything above a 93 is not going to be perceivable by the viewer. And and, in that, and, and that's pretty much what I did. And I also excluded any increase. So if this was the reverse, if it was 94 here and 96 here, no viewer is going to notice that because it's above the 94 rating. So I basically excluded all the 1080p scores from the VMAF, SSIM, and PSNR scoring system except when they came down below 94. And in that case, that was a really bad decision that people are going to notice. Okay, so that's, that's the hard part. Um, this is the top data rate of all seven technologies that I looked at. This is the 1080p file over the duration of all the test files. So, and I just kind of wanted to present this because we see a very consistent pattern of ups and downs between all, all the vendors. I said a few minutes ago that at the heart of each of these technologies is a, um, a complexity measurement and a, a quality-related measurement, and we see pretty, pretty good consistency. You know, there's some, some issues here with some of the files down here, but for the most part, a lot of the technologies are making the same decisions for, for all of the files. And I just I wanted to see how much there was consistency-wise, and there seemed to be a pretty good bit of it. So here are the companies that I rated. Um, the YouTube schema is one file in, five files out. We kind of covered the features at the start of the presentation. Um, they do not adjust the resolution. They do not adjust the number of rungs in the ladder. was kind of surprised about that when I actually downloaded the files. Um, here are the results. And what we see is YouTube has a surprisingly Surprising lack of consistency from a company that uses a neural network. So the standard deviation here is a lot higher than several of the several of the other candidates. So basically, that tells me that YouTube isn't using VMAP in their neural network. You know, they're using some other metric, and that's why it doesn't correlate well with VMAP. Where, I mean, somebody from BitMove is here; they could tell us what they're doing, but. Um, Anytime you see a, a, a lack of correlation, either the, the technology is doing a poor job or they're not correlating with VMAP. And we see a lot of storage saved because YouTube is cutting out a bunch of ladders from the encode. But we see YouTube is increasing the PSNR a little bit, but dropping SSIM and dropping VMAP by a lot, which means they're dropping, on, the, on an average basis, they're dropping the VMAP value by two over the fixed bitrate ladder. And that's probably not going to be visible, but, but that's a significant number. They had a lot of errors that could interrupt smooth playback. They had a lot of jumps that were either, in all cases, they were over 2.1x, which could strand a viewer. That's kind of a big deal. They made a decent number of good decisions and bad decisions. Um, and they had a lot of losses 
you know, a lot of instances where the files loss in VMAP score exceeded one because they, they don't have a file between 480p and 720p. And that's basically what it came down to. You need, you know, the most important rungs are at the top of the ladder. You need to serve those rungs. If you don't have a file to do that, you're going you're gonna to have a quality loss each one of those rungs. So CAP-CRF is a, is a technology you can implement at home. Um, you know, here's the command string in FFmpeg. You basically say, pick a quality level. In this case, it's CRF23. Choose a max rate, choose a buffer size, and then choose an output file. And you do that for every rung on the encoding ladder. Um, CRF encodes to a specific quality level, not to a specific data rate, but you can apply the cap, which is what you see here. The cap CRF encode that we did, it's a frame by frame optimization. That means a funky bit rate pattern. Obviously, it relies on CRF encoding. It's a one pass technology, which means a lot of saved rungs. Um, can it factor in quality of experience stats? No. Can it adjust the data rate? They all can, yes. Does it change the number of files in the ladder? No, it does not. Adjust the resolution? No, it does not. And the only customizability is CRF and max rate. No bit rate control, no post encode quality check. So this is one you can do yourself. Um, Because there are no rungs eliminated, there's a poor savings in terms of overall data rate. They're pr producing all the data rate. They're not eliminating any of them. Um, there are modest savings here, modest savings here in terms of overall effect on quality. Um, they did great here because they didn't have any errors. There were no, you know, all the encoding ladders were, were in pretty good shape. And they had the most wins and two home runs, which is a nice boost in overall quality of experience. So this is something you can do yourself pretty easily. But they did have several losses. Bit move in. Um, there's two operating modes. You can upload a file and let them make all the decisions, basically return a ladder. Or you can upload a file and set a lot of limits, like lowest data rate, highest data rate, number of rungs in the ladder, specific rungs. What I did was just upload the file, and they sent back the results. Um, bit move and assesses complexity and creates the unique ladder. How many passes, Christian? Do you know? And is there any difference in price? That's a very good question. Okay. I think there is, right? Okay, so there is a difference in price. So I'm sure it's, it's multiple passes here. Does it factor in Q, QOV stats? No. Does it adjust the data rate? Yes. Change the number of files on the ladder? Yes. Adjust resolution? Yes. Customizability? Yes, but I didn't use it. Bit rate control? I don't think so. So can you do a CBR or VBR encoder? You just get what you get. OK. And then post encode quality check, not, not, as I not as I implemented it. So what was really impressive about Bitmovin was they were the most consistent quality assessor. So they had the lowest standard deviation. Again, this is all the 1080p files. The standard deviation between the VMAP scores was, was the lowest that we saw, which means they're a very accurate predictor of compressed quality. Do you guys use VMAP in your? OK, so you know, it's kind of a chicken and egg thing. If you use VMAP to calibrate your system, you're going to be accurate for VMAP. Um, in either, you know, those are the, I trust VMAP because it's a Netflix uh, metric, and, and it, it seemed to work pretty well here. We had decent storage savings and bitrate savings, not the most, but not the lowest. Um, we had the best overall quality improvements in all three metrics meaning that on an overall basis, Bitmovin produced the highest incre increase in visual quality of all the technologies that I tested. And that was pretty impressive. Um, they had excellent ladder integrity, zero errors. They had the best decision making. So they made 16 good decisions, five bad decisions. And they had the most total wins and home runs with no losses. And that was, again, that was pretty impressive. Um, the one caveat about Bitmovin, which is not a knock in any sense of the word, is that 
we, I scored these videos based upon this distribution pattern. So if you had a distribution pattern that looked only at the top rung or was bottom weighted, you probably would get a, a different result. I didn't tell them my distribution pattern, they just you know, sent the results back. So results could change, but either way, as we tested, uh, bit moving came out pretty well. And then unsub three, I'm including kind of as a, a cautionary tale. Um, basically, their core scheme is they assess complexity and then they just really bomb the data rate. It's a two pass technology. They don't factor in the quality of experience stats, adjust the data rate, but not the number of rungs or the resolution. It's not customizable. You can do bit rate control. There is no post encode quality check. And what we see, what they did was they, they basically, you know, this is a very high emotion video. Here, the top rung was 4.4 megabits per second. They just dropped the data rate to 1.927 to an, a VMAP score of 86. So, and they just did that up and down the encoding ladder to where you're getting very, very low scores on the VMAP side. And anytime you scored below a one, it was a loss. With this technology, they scored several that were in the, the five to 10 range, which no other, no other per title technology even approached. So, worst consistency, the most savings, but the savings was illusory because they had the worst quality of experience hit over all the files that I tested, and by far the most losses. And again, I left them in kind of as a cautionary tale. If, if you see a technology that says we give you the absolute lowest data rates, you should assume they're going to give you the absolute lowest quality, because it's not. And then, OK, all that said, what are the questions you ask when you're considering a per title encoding technology? You want to figure out if it's optimization, per title, per scene, per shot. Um, I think QOE stats are going to be huge over the next two or three years. You know, and you see a company like Brightcove can do that because they, they own end-to-end. -end. Um, Epic Labs is a Spanish company. They've integrated with nice people at work to use their quality of experience stats. Mux is a QOE company, so they integrate their own. I think getting, getting data and using that data effectively is going to be important for all encoders going forward. Can you apply traditional data rate controls, VBR, CBR, if that's important? Um, does it reduce the number of rungs and the resolutions? We saw why that's important. Um, how does it impact encoding cost? Can you specify, you know, is it customizable so you can specify the lowest bit rate file and the maximum? And then, you know, hopefully from a testing perspective, my scoring system is, you know, it's a, it's a total pain in the butt. I just didn't see any way to effectively rate the technologies without putting together a, a construct like that. So. And this, um, for people who came late, Mr. Vaughn, the, um, I'm going to go back to a, uh, if I can get to the front, it, it's available for download. OK, any, any questions? Good question, and you know, I kind of knocked on Elemental a few times, it, and really didn't mean to knock them. It was really just describing their technology. But one of the benefits of being able to do a rung by rung and not change the resolution is you can do it live. So Elemental has a live um, has a live technology, as does Harmonic, and I'm thinking there's one more, but I'm it's not coming to me. It's got to be a better way, right? OK, there's the handout. Any other questions? But it would it seem though the ranking is quite dependent on VMAP, and perhaps the company that uses VMAP is in the office of my head. Would it be interesting to repeat it with a CSNR and SSM or, or take your other metric analysis and see if you get the, the same fallout of the slide? I mean, I. I, I yeah, well, I kind of tracked all that. Um, the only thing I didn't do was score based on that. So I, I could, but it's, it's pretty time consuming. I'm going to spend the next couple of weeks verifying the scores on the two companies that I, I want to track. And then 
I mean, any comments on the scoring system? I, I really did kind of make it up as I went along. Um, I tried to, so if, if you have any comments either, you know, now or any time in the show, I'd like to hear it because I'm going to do one more round of this and then put out a final report. But you, you know, you're right, I could. It's, I don't like SSIM because it's just, the numbers are just too tiny. They don't make sense to me. PSNR, it would be interesting because it, you know, Bitmovin's using VMAF, that's why they correlated with VMAF. Um, that's why they scored well on this system. But there's some of that echo chamber stuff going on, but um, I, I just trust VMAF more than I do with any other metric. That's so now you have another dimension in your analysis, and you need to know clean yourself and closing. That's that's um that's a great point. So VMAP VMAP has three metrics. They've got a phone model or three three models. They've got a phone model, they've got the default model, and they've got a 4K model. I use the default model, and I really thought about using the phone model on the three or four lowest rungs, but I was <laughs> way over budget, way out of time. But it's a great observation. The other, the other thing that kind of mitigated against that was that um, it was such a low percentage. You know, the bottom three or four rungs was, was such, although that really doesn't matter, right? Because the, it, it would have been very difficult to do and it would have, would have been very time consuming. But I understand that it's a great point. So, I mean, so how, how would you how would how would you use this in a live scenario? I mean, I think again that's the point about about why Elemental did what they did. So I don't think you I don't think you try and adjust resolution and, and uh, the number of rungs in the ladder on the fly. Not on the fly, but the, the, the question is how do you how do you define the, the initial set? Well, I, you know, the initial set is just the first try. I mean, you could do it. You could pick it out of a hat. The question is, how do you? If you have data that, you know, that tells you how it's being played, once you have that data, you can make your judgments. But the, um, you know your market better than anybody. And, but really, the first try isn't that important. It's what you do with the data and how you refine it you know, after you get data back. Well, let me get this gentleman. Um, kind of above my pay grade. Yeah. Um, I mean, I, I, so how would you encourage other companies to do this? I think by, um, it really comes from customer demand. Encoding.com at NAB, I interviewed their, their great uh, founder, and he said, we're not doing per title because not a lot of people are asking for it. So I think, you know, he, it's on their radar. And, and does, does Elemental have per title? Anybody know? Anybody know they don't? I mean, because there's a couple of companies who don't have it yet from the encoding side. Um, that's even another level of company beyond that, right? They have one Elemental or? or OK. OK. Any other questions? I'm sorry. Um, so, if I had my druthers, would I would I try and figure out the bit rates or the quality settings? Um, I, I think the bit rate is it's easier for me to understand. You, you sounds like you have a better idea, but the um, you know at the end of the, at the end of the day, people as the Brightcove stats showed us, people retrieve files at certain bit rates. So once you know that, whether it's his problem or what you're suggesting, 
you just want to supply the best possible quality you can at that bit rate. That's kind of mine. Any other questions? I mean, I, I can't possibly repeat that statement for the camera, but the, um, I mean, I think, I think the whole Netflix, not that this matters and not this is what you're asking, but I think Netflix has a whole structure designed to figure out what is the optimal resolution at every bit rate. And I think, I think bit rate is always to a, to a significant degree to get to determine quality. And, it, so, and, and that's, that's the, the best starting point from my perspective. I, your point's a great one and how the models are changing, but either way it's gonna be, what's my bit rate? What's the best resolution for that bit rate to get the best quality? Do you still have to engineer a network for bit rate? Pardon? Do you still have to engineer a network for bit rate? Okay. Right? So you, it's, it's the matrix of bit rate. Yeah, but I, you know, as an encoding guy, you just, I just need to know what the bit rate is. And then, then I'll work from there. Any other questions? How about a round of applause for bit movement? Okay, thank you very much. Enjoy the show.